before this episode begins, I just wanted to point out that there is a cicada in the background during the beginning. Sun was going down. It was the middle of summer when we did this interview. So there's a little cicada there. But it goes away after like the first minute or so. Just wanted to let you know it won't be there the whole time. All right, now on to the episode. I'm Tom Ray from the band Lorenzo's Music, and this is the first episode of our new podcast, The Lorenzo's Music Podcast. This show is going to be about people who make music, or promote music, or video, or people who like to make things, stuff like that. The idea started this way. We're a band that has been releasing music that is free to use under Creative Commons license for several years. That means it's free to use for your own projects, or you can remix it or build upon it. Our current release, Romcom Mixtape, went even further. We recorded the whole thing using open source software and tools. So we've gotten emails and messages from people over the years who tell us that they've used our music for games and videos and short films. And from that, it's been really fascinating to see just the things that people out there are making. There are just so many people out there doing amazing things that we got a chance to be a part of. But, usually after that, we don't really have a reason to get to know each other. And I wanted to change all that. I wanted to know more about what these people creating things are doing. Why do they make things? What kind of struggles do they go through? Why do they do what they do? I wanted to make more connections with other people in the world. So what I did is I sent out a message to people on our email list just asking if they wanted to tell me about what they do. This season I'll be talking to gamers, app makers, musicians, and in the case of the person that I'm talking to today, music curators. My name is Cheyenne Homan and I am the current managing director of the Free Music Archive. The Free Music Archive is a site that I found out about a few years back. Our music was featured on a compilation by one of the net labels connected to the site. And since then, it's been one of the biggest sources where filmmakers have discovered our music. Originally, this interview was going to be about how the Free Music Archive was starting its yearly pledge drive. But soon after we recorded the episode, Cheyenne contacted me to let me know that the site would be ending its long run this year and shutting down, which is a huge loss for musicians all over the world. But you know, Cheyenne has done so much to support music through what she does that I wanted to focus on her as a fan. So this episode is a tribute to what she's done. Could you explain what the Free Music Archive is? I know that you've been working there for... uh, Actually, I think you're the longest program director I've known that's been working there so far. It's four years, yeah. And the thing's only like eight years old, so I think... By the math alone, I'm the (laughs) the longest running in the project. Yeah. So the Free Music Archive is a big online repository of music. The music is licensed using primarily Creative Commons licenses, which allow people to use the music for various things without having to apply for a license or negotiate a license individually with an artist. I do a lot of education about what licensing means, how copyright applies to music, and how people can, you know, work within those boundaries or how different Creative Commons licenses can kind of help them reach their goals as musicians or uh, filmmakers or DJs or whatever. Okay. And I just realized we have a fun little cicada thing going on in the background over here. Are you hearing that? A little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So little, little ambient noise. So we're sitting out here and since this is audio, let's, let's build our, our own little uh, scene here. So we're sitting in the middle of a field talking about Creative Commons licenses. No. So now, do you, the outreach and the, the stuff where you help people figure that out, is that new? Is that something that you brought upon yourself or was that always part of the job? I think it's just a function of doing what we do. The, the idea behind Creative Commons has only been around for, you know, a decade and yeah. a half maybe. So it's still kind of a relatively new idea to the internet. And so I do a lot of education from the ground level where people are like, I don't know what this is. Uh How do I use it? All the way up to very specific questions of like, okay, I want to use this thing for this type of distribution. Does this apply? The education piece is something that I don't think was intended when the Free Music Archive was started. But because it's such a new idea, I think that the educational portion of what we do is inevitable. It makes sense because it's one of the things where 
I'm going to say my own personal theory on it was like, cause I, I had spoken with uh, Jason Siegel, who mm-hmm. that was the first person I ever met at the free music archive. He was the director when the project started. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was more, it was the source to get music to play on podcasts and things like that. Back when that was when, when people were afraid of you downloading their albums back, back yeah. when that was a thing. Yeah. And actually I think one of the ideas for names for the archive was the pod safe music library like it was meant to be like podcast safe because a lot of music without creative commons licenses was like sure to get you nailed for copyright violations if you were trying to distribute a, a podcast that had copyrighted recordings by major artists the idea was to kind of free up some of that stuff so that people could still do music podcasts or you know put audio in podcasts and not have to worry about it so much. I think Ken Friedman, the director of, or the, the station manager at WFMU, which is the radio station that started the Free Music Archive, told people that they were going to try to launch the site with 100,000 songs on it or something. And, you know, of course, they started from zero and worked their way up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I actually was uh, working in Jersey City when we hit the 100,000 song mark. And we're now at about 125,000 wow. tracks. So it continues to grow steadily, which is great. What's also great about it too, is that it's curated. It's not just everybody go upload your music here. It's something where people who mm-hmm. care about the music, not, not that you go like, no, you can't, but this is part of the outreach. Cause it's also the understanding of, you can't just upload every song. Like you have to allow it to be used for this particular purpose. Yeah. Sometimes people get upset because we do reject some submissions. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people will cold call us and say like, Hey, I made this music. Can you put it on your archive? And the music is clearly like cobbled together from garage band samples and it's yeah. not interesting. And we have plenty of electronic music on the free music archive. So it has to be something that we think has more artistic merit than I made something on my computer, but a lot of stuff does get in. And so, you know, if you do ambient music that is somehow more compelling or if you make like just standard like i don't know what it would be called now um edm with you know something interesting going on yeah then we'll, we'll let it in but you know if it's just generic sounding we don't really it's stiffer competition for electronic artists yeah we'll say. no you guys have a wide or probably one of my favorite filter features ever is the filter feature that you guys have going on. Like the, you go into rock and then you go into category. Like I learned about what shoegaze was from the first time (laughs) that I visited the free music archive. Oh, that's awesome. We try our best to kind of put things in at least like the broad categories that they belong in. So, and all of the genre tags are hand done. So we don't have any automation for those tags. So for something like surf rock, either an artist categorized their music as surf or somebody, you know, me or a volunteer decided that it was surf and it stuck it in that category. But yeah, we have a lot of drill down potential for, you know, if somebody wants to learn about a new genre of music, we've, we've got quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. You guys are definitely a diverse musical taste group, not just like a, yeah. Hey, you know, we only upload this kind of music type stuff. No, I mean, definitely because I think we started from, a freeform radio station like WFMU, Mm -hmm. there's probably more experimental music on it than there would be if it wasn't from like a hippie noise radio station, Yeah, which they probably call themselves a hippie noise radio station. (laughs) I'm not (laughs) not trying to throw shade on them, you know, and there's a lot of like rock and punk and stuff like that. Um, But we have, you know, blues, we have accordion Mm -hmm. music, we have classical music, we have spoken word things, all sorts of, you know, just a huge variety. And I think that that's one of the strengths was coming from a freeform station. The people that were building the site had this really broad sensibility about music. It wasn't like, oh, I wonder if we can get Rihanna's new album on this free website. It was like, what are people elsewhere doing? And like, we will listen to any submission. And we, and we do, we get a lot of really, really interesting stuff to listen to and, and, review but yeah we try really hard to make sure that those genres are correct Mm -hmm. and that they are not just a categorization tool but also a discovery tool you 
you did a whole thing, I think it was a little over a year ago, you did the music for video. Mm-hmm. That was a big thing. And now like tons of people know, like you go to forums and stuff like filmmaking ones and they're like, where can I find music? Boom. They talk about you guys. Honestly, I feel like at this point we've, we've kind of made the rounds. People have spread the word of mouth and like we get shout outs on Twitter often or Reddit on forums where people are looking for music for their podcasts or their films. We try our best to provide as much documentation and resource and like educational know-how that we can pull into our site so that it's easier for people. I wanted to rewind just a little bit and yeah. tell you that the WFMU curator section on the website is managed by me. But last year, they hit the 20,000 track mark. Really? So they have submitted more music than most other. I would hope pages. so. I would actually be yeah. very disappointed if they didn't. That would be kind yeah. of embarrassing. They have they have a phenomenal amount. It's 20,000 tracks is so much music. More than I could ever listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, and the music for video is a curator section that is intended to filter music that comes in and sort of like funnel it into one place. So it's easier for people who are working on films to just go straight to this part of the site instead of having to sort of sift through manually or try to search by license, which can be great. Like our license filtering tools are really good. They really are. But um, they don't filter for like super specific, like if you want like a very, very specific sound, it might be easier Mm. to just search within music for video than it would be to search within the entire site. 30,000 song collection versus our whole 125,000 song collection or something. You know, it's like yeah. Quite a lot. Music is not, not licensed for video, which but I have to remind people of often. The filtering by the specific license is awesome. That's really hard to get anywhere else. And if you do, it's super difficult to get at and you can't continue to search for it. Yours, you know, you can scroll through, but you're right. It's like, if I need something for like, I can't think of anything. I want to say something with a chainsaw in it, (laughs) (laughs) like some movie where you have a chainsaw. That's the first thing that popped into my mind. I don't Uh know why, but like, say you need something for like a chainsaw massacre movie. You can't really filter by that. Or maybe you could, I suppose it might be in the name. Maybe. (laughs) Never know. There's some artists that really, really cater to people that, are looking for very specific soundtrack cues. And that's great. I mean, that's a business model for some of them and they get a lot of work that way. So it's cool, but it's also kind of funny to see the names of songs that are just sort of like babble, you know? (laughs) Oh, definitely. Yeah. I know a few artists uh, going through there over the years. I know a few artists that have that. Now you're not, you're not in a band or anything, right? No. And I love this. And this is why I want to ask this. People who are just fans of music, mm-hmm. I've always just admired that. Well, being a musician, it's, it, it helps me a lot, but yeah. it, that people just like music. But I've met so many people over the years who are just so big fans. And also like, and usually when they are, I mean, we're talking like, for lack of a better example, like high fidelity movie, like deep cut fans, you know, mm-hmm. they don't just listen to one thing. So Mm -hmm. what's that like? I don't know. I I can't figure out how to form the question. You see where I'm getting at though? But like, it's, tell me about that. Like why, why is it that way for real diehard music fans? Well, you know, I think for me, I wanted to be in a band and I like learned how to play a few instruments. I did a couple of like teeny tiny musical projects. I was, I played flute in school. Like I, you know, I, I know how to read music. I can do that sort of thing. And I know how like tours work and setting up shows and that sort of stuff too. So like I kind of, I know a bit about a lot of different angles of the music scene. And I think that it's just always been part of who I am. My parents were really into music when I was growing up. And so I was always exposed to different things and got really into, I mean, I still love some of the bands that they loved when I was growing up. Like I still listen to the B-52s. I still listen to Devo. Like they were very like new wave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I love that stuff. And, you know, I hung around in the punk scene in the late nineties. And so as was required got, by law. <laughs> yeah. Right. I had a skateboard I didn't use very much. And, you know, yeah, it was just always kind of, it was, it was an inter lacing of social and like artistic interest. And then when I went to college, I did radio. And actually my first taste of radio was very, very young. Really? Um, my parents were friends with a guy who 
had built his own radio transmitter. He had a pirate radio station that was like, it just played classical music. And like, he just wanted to do it. I think he didn't. How how broad was the reach? Oh, it wasn't. It was maybe a couple square miles. It wasn't very big. Okay. So it was like a radio shack pirate thing. Totally. Okay. Yeah. It was very, very small scale, but he was like, Oh, you can like put this record on and like tell everybody what it is. And I was like, really? Okay. I was like eight years old. Okay. And I was just, you know, I was like, this was amazing. This was so cool. You know, I did college radio for a few years and then got into, I did audio production for a university. I interviewed faculty and students and did a series of podcasts for them. I also did like lecture recordings and stuff like that for the university. And then got this job at the Free Music Archive and kind of was able to put a lot of those skills to use. And they let me do fill-ins too. So like I still got to DJ occasionally, which was a lot of fun. Oh, cool. And this was all just, you learned it on your own? You didn't go to school? Oh, wow. Yeah, self-taught. So I'm sure that my production practices may not be (laughs) by the book, but they're, you know, it's good enough. I'm the sole full-time employee for this archive. You are? So, yeah. Oh. I'm I'm the one full-time person, and then we have a part-time person who does all of the technical work. Right. That's the web guy. Yeah. Okay. The web guy's part-time, and I'm full-time, and that's it. I didn't realize that. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. So <laughs> funding comes from grants. It comes from our fundraiser, and it comes from WFMU. They subsidize some of our, our costs because... Yeah. They started the project and they got a really generous grant to start it. Do you write the grants or are there people like, do you have board members that write it or how do you get those? It's all me. Really? Yeah. My God. You should yeah, be wearing, it's a lot of work. be wearing a cape. For I should be wearing a stack of hats because that's what I do all day. <laughs> Different hats all day. Oh, like that Dr. Seuss book where the guy has yes. the stack of hats. Is it, is it a Dr. Seuss book? I don't know. I'm guessing, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Isn't the, there's like a hat seller? It's called Hats for Sale. It might be. Right? I'm thinking of Caps for Sale, which is about a hat seller that's like harassed by a monkey. <laughs> we got totally derailed there about children's books about hats. That's fine. That's it is fine. It's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was going to ask like how many people are involved in the offices there or is there an office? 1.5 people. <laughs> 1.5. So only half of them yeah. shows up a day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I work full time and I was working from the main offices at WFMU. I have since moved to Los Angeles. I relocated. I wasn't really feeling New York. So I hear you. Winter. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm from Kentucky originally. So it's like California is a little slower than New York. Oh, really? A little easier, easier on my constitution. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not as brutally cold, which is also nice. And remarkably, it's a little bit more affordable in LA. Not a lot more, but a little more. Our web guy lives and works in Milwaukee. So everybody's remote. Yeah. We meet online. Yeah, we have two meetings a week online and we check in and, you know, co-work via, you know, chat. So I didn't know that he was in Milwaukee. That's that's funny. Yeah. He, so he's like an hour and a half away from me right now. Where are you? I'm in Madison. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. Then he's your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does some stuff with River West Radio. Oh, really? Milwaukee. Again, with the just the being involved in music <laughs> stuff. I love that so much. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think like also the musical to go back to that question for a second. Yeah. The musical expressions that have come out of me are not as good as some of the other artistic expressions that I've made. Okay. And so I kind of feel like I'm better suited for writing and visual art than Mm -hmm. I am sonic art. And so I just kind of continue to be a fan of, of other people's better sonic art than mine. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and you told me in the past, you've said that you make zines and stuff. Are you still doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't put out a zine in a while, but I'm slowly compiling, doing research, if you will, for a zine that I've been doing for a few years called Empty Orchestra. And it's about karaoke bars. <laughs> it's a review zine of different karaoke bars. Awesome. So I've been I've been going to karaoke bars in L.A. to check out the scene and, you know, do write ups. So it's fun. <laughs> One of the things that I'm super excited about is we're going to be taking submissions in the next couple of months 
for music set to public domain nursery rhymes and children's poetry. And we're going to make a children's treasury of music. No, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be all public domain lyrics or like, you know, source material. And then people write their own music and put the nursery rhymes or whatever, if it's from like a fable or something like that, they can take whatever they want from, from the public domain, but any kind of like kid friendly story or poem they can put to music and then they'll be released as a, as a complete volume of music that's kid friendly because that's one thing we kind of don't have a lot of is kid friendly music on the free music archive. Yeah. And and you're saying stuff that people write specifically for it, not like go out and take this poem from like whoever children's poets are. I don't know any, but, but you're, or something. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Yeah. So you're, you're saying like stuff that people make up themselves, but it's for this particular set. People can make up their own poetry and, and do their own children's music. Okay. But the idea is that if you want inspiration, I'm compiling a big sort of master list of poems from the public gotcha. domain that people I'm can sorry. choose from. I misunderstood no, that no, that's part. Fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. So we're going to be putting together a bunch of music that will be tagged kid friendly that'll go in the kid friendly category, which is a fairly new genre. And, you know, we have one net label for kids called Kazoom Zoom, but we know that people are looking for music for their kids or for videos with their kids or, or whatever. So see, that's the beauty of the curation more... is you're saying there's something we don't have. Let's mm -hmm. figure out a way that we can get people to, or maybe people that aren't even aware that they could do this here. Yeah. Let's to... encourage people to, to contribute to the commons and like expand our collection in this direction that is lacking right now. Yeah. And create more community. I like that so much. And the other thing too, is you reminded me of, well, I would personally say that you guys should take credit for the fact that happy birthday is actually now in the public domain. <laughs> yeah. You had, I know we raised a ruckus about that. <laughs> but, but it, it did happen like soon after you guys. So you guys had a very similar thing where it was somebody else write a song for people's birthdays that they can use that's yeah. in the public domain and or creative commons and mm -hmm. not even, I want to say not even a month after you guys picked a winner, happy birthday finally went in the public domain. So would, is that you, would you take, I, I'll give you credit for that. I'm down with it. If you want to give us credit, we will take it. <laughs> um, but I definitely think, I think that the court proceedings took a little bit longer, but they, and they started after the, the happy birthday song contest okay. challenge, what, what have you had concluded. So I think it finally went to the public domain about a year ago, maybe two. Yeah. The happy birthday contest was a year or two before that, but the, the wheels of bureaucracy turn slowly. So that's a kid's um, poem yeah, right we, there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and we brought a lot of attention to the fact that it was a super old song. It was super simple and there was no reason for it not to be in the public domain. Absolutely. Uh, it was super old. And it's so, I mean, it's like, how could it, I think it was Warner Music claimed it and charged people $10,000 yeah. a pop to use it in films. And that's I was like, what's oh, crazy. Racket. I know. I know. Yeah. I guess that's a revenue stream that's dried up for them and like, oh, boo hoo. But like, that is unbelievable. I think We Shall Overcome has also been added to the public domain as well. Oh. Like after that, I think it's kind of the same people that took the case for happy birthday, took it to court for we shall overcome because I think some other publishing company was claiming that. And it's also like, that should be in the public domain. Yeah. That's a super old song. <laughs> We've got a partnership right now with this music startup called Musio out of Singapore. Oh and yeah. Yeah, they've been taking songs from our collection that they like and feeding it to their robot who then spits out a big playlist with similar songs and they're posting them as playlists every other week. Huh. And that's been super cool to see like cuz I'm I'm discovering songs through this through these playlists that I may or may not have heard before on FMA because it pulls from the entire timeline. Most of what I hear is what's coming in that's fresh or things that have come in since I've been director. And so, you know, but there were like years and years of music before that. 
that I hadn't really spent a lot of time with. Aren't you kind so of saying that you you could be replaced by a robot? <laughs> No, I don't think so. I didn't make you just much. admitted that it did a really good job. Well, it did, but I would say, you know. You're busy running the place, man. Right. That's what it is. Well, also the thing is like with my podcast, if I just wanted to do genre specific shows, it could probably help me with that. But if I want to do shows that are like, here are the songs that I think are the best from this curator, that robot <laughs> doesn't know what to do with that. All right. There you <laughs> so, go. There you go. Yeah. You proved your point there. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Maybe, I'll, maybe I could split, split my time with the robot. I'll yeah. give it back to you now. All right. <laughs> Plus robots are fun. It would be neat. A lot of music, music research, uh, labs and stuff have, have come to us asking to use pieces of the collection that are licensed openly okay. to teach their music software to do stuff. So I think that's pr pretty cool serving a purpose to educate our Computer overlords, something about music. <laughs> <laughs> We're striving for diversity. We don't want to just be an electronic music archive. We don't want to just be, you know, a rock and roll archive. We, we want all sorts of music. So we have, I, I really prize our collections that are smaller, but, you know, more interesting. We have some really good Afrobeat. We have a lot of good pop music from France. We have a couple of artists that are specialized in specific instruments that do really, really cool work. You know, I think that some of the, the international collections we have are the most valuable educationally for people because yeah. some of this music is ethnic music that is hard to find. We have throat singers from Georgia, like the country, you know, it's, right. you know, we have we have some stuff that's just really, really incredible sonic artifacts from live performances and, and interviews and things like that that are just priceless. And I think that it's really cool that it's also free for everybody. Yeah. And don't forget, you also have this little uh, indie lo-fi band from Madison called Lorenzo's Music on there. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do. Oh, sorry. I had to throw in the self-plug. The library from the FMA will still be available after it's shut down. They're backing the whole thing up to the Internet Archive, but it's really sad that they'll no longer be around. So I wanted to mention one of the other places available where you can upload your music and find music for videos is called Gemendo at gemendo.org. So if you're not familiar, check it out and see if it's for you. Next time on the show, I'll be talking to a YouTuber who reviews games and music. You can subscribe to the show at lorenzosmusic.com where you can also find all of our music to download for free. Also, if you want to, you can check out my other show, an artist podcast called American Bandito, a show where I decided to go around my city of Madison, Wisconsin and meet people in the local art community. You can check that out at AmericanBandito.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you later. <laughs>